I got a video request today to uh, make a specific video from a fellow YouTuber, uh, Lelit41 or Lelit41. It's L E L I T 41. Uh, he had made a, he sent me an email saying he'd seen that I'd done video requests in the past, and I do like to do video requests. If you have video requests, I do like to get to them if I can, and if it's something I have the ability to do. Uh, so I, I thought I would uh, do the one he requested. He sent me an email stating that he had uh, seen that I had mentioned once before that I've had to pull my weapon once in my civilian life in self-defense, and he kind of wanted to know what was it like, how did I react, what was the adrenaline like. Uh, because he said there's a lot of people on YouTube that show a lot of tactical stuff, but they never really relate real world experiences. So, you know, my real world experience is very limited, but I can give you the one time that I did actually have to pull a weapon on an attacker. Uh, now, this is not defending property. We used to, you know, when I was a younger kid, we used to go out with my grandfather with a shotgun and chase off trespassers and poachers all the time. This is different. This is, you're in a situation where you're being attacked by someone and you have to pull a weapon to defend yourself under fear of your life. I was in Birmingham, Alabama many years ago. I was with a friend and we were going to some bars downtown Birmingham. And uh, there's a place where you get right off the interstate and you go into downtown Birmingham right there as you first get into the city coming up from Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, we pulled off the interstate and as you go off the ramp you go to an underpass and you stop at a stoplight. Well, we came down the interstate, we pulled up to, there was another car at the stoplight. The light was green, but the car wasn't going. I pulled up behind him, I honked my horn lightly, you know, like, okay, light's green, go. Well, about that time, light turns yellow. But as soon as I pull up behind him, another car sitting off to the side on the underpass pulls up and pulls up to close enough to tap our bumper. And we are pinned between the back car and the front car. At that time, people get out of both the front car and the car behind us, and they start coming around to our to the passenger side and the driver's side door. Uh, right away I knew this wasn't a good thing and uh, I didn't feel like I could power my way out because these were big heavy cars and I was in a little, actually a little Honda CRX at the time. And uh, kind of knew this was going to not go well. So at the time I always carried a, a, a Taurus 357 Magnum revolver. It was a four inch uh, stainless gun. I believe it was a 605. And I kept it tucked next to the seat when I drove. This is right after I had just come off of uh, duty as a uh, law enforcement officer. I had just quit that job not long before this happened. So I was still carrying most of the time. Now I've been carrying, like I say, for I've had a gun on me in one way or another, either in uh, on duty or off duty, legally carrying a gun for about 20 years. I've been concealed carrying for about seven years now, six or seven years now. Uh, but these people came to the door, kind of started coming out of the doors, and I noticed that when the one guy got out of the front, one of them had a chain in his hand and one of them had a ball bat. So I immediately went into, okay, this is not good. I pulled the gun out from between the seats, rolled my window the rest of the way up. This was, my window was down in Alabama. This is back when you had crank windows. So I rolled the window the rest of the way up, and as he came over to the window, he actually tapped on my hood of my car with the, with the bat and told me to roll the window down. And at that time, I pointed my gun out the window at him. And I'm not a person who usually uses racial slurs or anything like that, but uh, I did use a racial slur. I said, I will shoot your racial slur ass right through this windshield. And as soon as he saw the gun, actually the guy on the other side saw the gun first and freaked out and yelled, he's got a gun, and took off running. He didn't even get in one of the cars, he just took off running. Uh, as soon as the other guys realized that and heard it, they all ran jumped in their cars. The car behind us took off. The guy in front of us jumped in his car and took off. The car stalled as it took off into the intersection. It just died dead. He jumped out and ran. Uh, my nerves were really up. I was really amped at this time. So I did something really stupid. I got out of the car. I got out of the car with the gun and walked into the intersection. <laughs> You know, looking to see where he ran to, was there anyone still around. I should have just stayed where I was at. Now, this was before cell phones, so I couldn't call for anyone from the car. And, uh, but I, was, I could have backed the car away now, which is what I should have done. I should have backed the car away, driven to, to safety, and driven to a police station. But I didn't. I got out of the car. Uh, luckily, I had the good sense to tuck the gun back into my pants as I noticed there was no one else around. Because right as I did that, a state trooper pulled off the interstate on the other side and was coming down to the intersection and saw me standing there and flashed his lights and I waved him down and he stopped and I gave him the story. Well he was not surprised, He's, apparently that's something that happened in Birmingham all the time at the time. He asked me what they looked like, where they went, I told him this is the car he was driving, blah blah blah. Took a statement, he sent us on our way, uh, <clears throat> we went out and did our thing that evening, was heading back to uh, Alabama. 
We went back to Alabama. I got a call the next morning from the police saying that they've caught, uh, I think it was four of the five guys that were involved. I think it was five guys total that were involved. Uh, and they said that they caught them because the lead driver was actually, the car he was driving the stall was his mother's car that he had stolen from his mother and she had reported stolen. And that's how they caught them. But they said, well, they may need me to come to court. They may need me to testify, blah, blah, blah. I said, not a problem. I'll make the trip. It's only a couple hours. Uh, never had to. I think they uh, got them on other charges. Also, I think they were, they were involved in a string of things. So I never ended up having to come testify. But that's the one time I've ever had to pull my weapon in self-defense in civilian life. Uh, it wasn't that dramatic, and I never got to do any, you know, fancy rolls or, or, you know, trick shots or anything. Never even got to fire the gun. I just drew it, and the sight of the gun alone was enough to end the situation. Uh, so that was it. That was pretty simple. The adrenaline was pretty high. At the time, it seems like everything is just going in slow motion. Uh, you feel like you're, you know, you're just really trapped in a bubble of, of things that are happening around you and you don't really uh, have a perception of how long things are taking or what's really even happening. It was, it was pretty quick, but it seemed like it took a lot longer to me. It was probably the whole encounter overall probably lasted between 30 and 45 seconds from the time they got out of their car to the time they ran. But to me, it seemed like a lot longer. Uh, and even though I had been trained in the military and with law enforcement to deal with situations like that, it was still very stressful. My adrenaline still pumped very high, and I was really wound up for the rest of the night, to be honest. It took me a day or so to really come down from that. It takes a long time for the adrenaline levels to drop in your blood sometimes. Uh, but like I say, that's my story. It's nothing real exciting. It's nothing real tactical. Uh, it's no shots fired. Just a simple, simple story.